The following program covers the conclusion of the American Revolutionary War and the newly realized independence of the United States of America, a period from 1781 to 1787. The date is on the bottom right. Beneath the date is the British monarch, George III. The Prime Minister of Britain, Lord North, is listed below. The President of the United States Congress is Thomas McKean. It's October 1781. Continental patriots have been in open hostilities with the British for nearly seven years. The revolutionary government, the United States, is governed by a Congress in Philadelphia. Congress operates under the newly ratified Articles of Confederation. Cities that are in control of American continentals are in blue. Red cities are in possession of Britain, and yellow signifies Spanish possession. There are four cities in the United States that still have significant British garrisons. New York City, Wilmington, Charleston, and Savannah. A British force at Yorktown, Virginia is about to surrender. Washington, Rochambeau, and Lafayette, in conjunction with the French Navy, have cut off and besieged Cornwallis's redcoats at Yorktown. On October 19, 1781, Cornwallis, surrounded and without options, surrenders. Over 7,000 redcoats surrender to the Franco-American forces a crushing setback for the British. Virginia is now free of British redcoats. Major actions are now concluded in North America. The British by this time are also losing Florida to Spain. Earlier in 1781, de Galvez had secured Pensacola, Florida. The Spanish reconquest of Florida from Britain is underway. Spain has also been active on the opposite side of the continent. We will slide over to the Pacific coast. In the fall of 1781, about the same time the British surrender at Yorktown on the Atlantic side, the Spanish Southwest expands further. The Spanish governor of California, Felipe de Neve, establishes El Pueblo de la Reina de Los Angeles, shortened later to Los Angeles. We will slide back to the East Coast. November 1781. In Philadelphia, John Hansen is named President of the United States and Congress Assembled. Hansen is the first President of Congress Assembled after the surrender of Cornwallis' troops at Yorktown. On November 18th, British Redcoats evacuate Wilmington, North Carolina. North Carolina is now free of British Redcoats. Let's zoom out. On November 25th, in London, Prime Minister Lord North learns of the surrender at Yorktown. Lord North, who had been Prime Minister through the American Revolutionary period, now accepts American independence. Formal peace will take time to negotiate. In the meantime, fighting continues between Europe's powers. On December 12, 1781, British and French ships battle for a second time at Ushant. 1781 comes to an end. January 1782. In Philadelphia, Congress succeeds in opening the Bank of North America, the United States' first commercial bank. The bank attempts to counter the new government's accumulating war debt. Let's zoom in to Britain. On February 27, 1782, in London, Parliament approves an end to the war in America. In March 1782, Parliament grants King George the power to begin the process of peace negotiations with the United States. We will zoom into London. The Thames River runs through the middle. The Houses of Parliament are along the West River Bank here. In March 1782, Parliament issues a vote of no confidence against Prime Minister Lord North. March 20th, Lord North, who led Parliament during the American Revolutionary period, resigns as Prime Minister. March 27th, Charles Watson Wentworth, Marquess of Rockingham, is now Prime Minister. The new Prime Minister marks a transfer of power from the Tories to the Whigs. Many Whigs, including Charles Watson Wentworth, had opposed the war for years. Formal peace negotiations are established with the United States. We will slide back across the Atlantic Ocean to America. In April 1782, Washington's army is back in New York State at Newburgh, north of New York City. The British still have a significant garrison in New York City. We will zoom out to the transatlantic world. April 9, 1782. Near the island of Dominica, the British Navy defeats de Grasse's French fleet at the Battle of the Sante. 
The British have resecured their profitable sugar islands and shown the European powers that His Majesty's fleet is still the dominant sea power. On the same day in Paris, the United States and British representatives are now meeting to formalize peace negotiations. The United States is represented in Paris by Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, John Adams, and Henry Lawrence. Different sides will need to negotiate a treaty agreeable to various parties, so the treaty negotiations take time. All sides want the fighting to conclude, so it's important for all parties, the victors and the defeated, to have their say and ensure a fair peace ensues, so that a new conflict does not erupt in short time. Peace in Paris will actually result in multiple treaties between different powers. With official peace negotiations underway, the British garrisons in America will continue to return home. In June 1782, in New York City, British General Clinton, overall commander in America, returns to Britain, ending his assignment in America. With General Clinton back in Britain, General Guy Carleton is now at New York and in command of British forces in North America. July 11, 1782, the British evacuate Savannah, Georgia. Georgia is now free of British troops. Thousands of loyalists and escaped slaves leave with the British ships. There are now just two cities with British garrisons remaining in the United States, Charleston and New York. In August 1782 in Philadelphia, Robert Morris, the financier of the United States, has been corresponding back and forth with Alexander Hamilton about the national debt and Congress's inability to raise revenues. Morris wrote, The scarcity of money also may be immediately relieved if the love of popular favor would so far give way to the love of public good as to enforce plentiful taxation. The Articles of Confederation was drafted while Congress was at war with Britain over taxation. Thus, the Articles did not provide the national government with powers to tax citizens directly. Even as British troops remain posted in Charleston and New York City, some see the next struggle ahead. The reality that a people who rose to revolution over taxation will need to pay their large war loans back. Men like Hamilton and Morris want the Articles amended to provide Congress with more power to levy taxes. Meanwhile, many Americans are looking west beyond the mountains in 1782. The new frontier poses challenges and opportunities. We will zoom into the frontier zone. The Ohio River is here. The Mississippi River is here. Two major points westward in the 1780s are the Ohio River, starting at Fort Pitt, modern-day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the Cumberland Gap near modern Middlesboro, Kentucky. The Ohio country in 1782 is home to powerful Native American nations, such as the Shawnee and Miami. These nations are increasingly drawn into the British-Canadian sphere to the north, and they are prepared to make a stand against settler expansion. In 1782, the Ohio Territory remains very dangerous for settler families. But to the south, many settlers are moving through the Appalachians at the Cumberland Gap near modern Middlesboro, Kentucky. Daniel Boone is marking trails through this Kentucky region west of the mountains. The Cumberland River flows from near the Cumberland Gap through this frontier territory to the Ohio River. In 1782, one of the many venturous families who moved west through the Cumberland Gap into Kentucky is the Lincoln family. In this same year, in a pioneer town of Lexington in modern Kentucky, a log schoolhouse is built. Also in 1782, further west on the Ohio River, Fort Nelson is built at modern Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville is named after the French king who had recently aided the Patriots against Britain. Further south, another pioneer town is growing on the Cumberland River at modern Nashville, Tennessee. Already in 1782, Kentucky frontiersmen are using the Ohio and Cumberland Rivers. Immediately following the Revolution, the Kentucky frontier zone is quickly filling with settlers. Some of the native tribes in this region are the Chickasaw, Cherokee, and Creek. On August 19, 1782, northeast of Lexington, the British and their Native American allies defeat Kentucky militia under Daniel Boone at Blue Licks. We will zoom out. 
The frontier battle at Blue Licks, Kentucky, foreshadows the future. While the East Coast is now at peace, the struggle between British Canada, Native Americans, and pioneers continues in the new frontier zone, which is the Kentucky region and the Ohio Territory. In November 1782, in Philadelphia, Elias Boudinot is now President of Congress. We will zoom out. November 30th, in Paris, the preliminary Treaty of Paris is concluded between the United States and Britain. In this treaty, Britain recognizes the United States as an independent nation, and the United States in turn agrees to pay its standing debts to British merchants. We will zoom in back to North America. On December 14, 1782, in Charleston, South Carolina, British troops load onto ships and evacuate the city. South Carolina is now free of British troops. Some 10,000 loyalists leave with the British at Charleston, half of whom are escaped slaves. New York City remains as the lone British garrison yet remaining in the United States. But in Washington's Continental Army Camp at Newburgh, New York, trouble is brewing. Continental soldiers have not been paid in months due to the national debt crisis and resentment is growing in the ranks. 1782 comes to an end. The new year and the preliminary peace bring new challenges. The United States in 1783, after the American Revolution, is in a similar position that Britain was in 20 years earlier after the French and Indian War. The victory came at a steep financial cost. Congress is in serious debt as it had borrowed substantial sums of money, being heavily reliant on French coffers. By now, the limits of the Articles of Confederation are being realized. On the one hand, the Articles fulfill the desire of a people who are suspicious of congressional powers for taxation. On the other hand, these limits placed on Congress make Congress powerless to raise the revenue to repay its debts. The result is that the United States' first currency note, the Continental, has been printed by a government with no money to back it in the first place. The phrase, not worth the Continental, is used in the streets. In January 1783 in Philadelphia, Congress is aware of the resentment in the Continental Army camp at Newburgh. There is a fear that the Army might turn against Congress. We will zoom out to the transatlantic world. In February 1783, Spain recognizes the sovereignty of the United States. We will zoom in to the northeastern United States. On March 12, 1783, in Philadelphia, Congress receives word that the United States and Britain have signed a peace treaty. Despite the good tidings, the unpaid Continental Army at Newburgh, New York, is a hotbed of conspiracy, bordering on mutiny. On the Ides of March 1783, in Newburgh, dissatisfied Continental officers hold a meeting. General Washington unexpectedly shows up at the meeting. His surprise presence ends the soldier conspiracy against Congress. Washington, unlike Julius Caesar, eases tempers instead of inflaming them. In April 1783, in Boston, Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court declares slavery abolished in that state. Massachusetts joins Pennsylvania in the column of states that have officially, legislatively abolished slavery. April 15. In Philadelphia, Congress ratifies preliminary articles of peace, the peace accord between the United States and Britain. In May 1783, in Philadelphia, the country's first daily newspaper, the Pennsylvania Evening Post, is in circulation. Issues with unpaid, dissatisfied veterans continue. In June 1783, there are enough dissatisfied veterans in Philadelphia that Congress will leave the city for New Jersey, meeting in different cities for the remainder of 1783. We will zoom out to the transatlantic world. September 3rd, 1783. In Paris, multiple treaties are finalized. Representatives from multiple nations sign the Treaty of Paris in which Britain formally recognizes American independence. Another treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, is also signed, a peace accord between Britain, France, and Spain. The conclusion of these multiple agreements are known collectively as the Peace of Paris. 
The United States is a recognized independent nation and peace is obtained between the major European powers. The conflict is officially over. We will zoom back into North America. The new peace provides gains and concessions for each party. The United States gains recognition as an independent country. Its boundary extends west to the Mississippi River and it includes much of the northwestern Great Lakes territories. Spain succeeds in retaking Florida from Britain, which it had historically held since the 16th century. Spain also holds New Orleans in the lands west of the Mississippi River. Britain retains loyal Canada and most of her economically important sugar islands in the Caribbean. The Americans, in turn, are required to repay their outstanding debts to British merchants from before 1775. Thus, on paper, the European powers agree that the United States extends from the Atlantic to the Mississippi River, save for British Canada in the north and Spanish Florida in the south. However, Native Americans living in these regions were not party to the treaty and never agreed to these terms. Sticking points quickly emerge. The British retain Fort Detroit, which is technically in violation of the boundary agreements set in the Treaty of Paris. However, the British argue that the Americans are not owning up to their end of the peace treaty by reimbursing debts to British merchants. So in 1783, the frontier shifts westward beyond the Appalachian Mountains. A fault line is in the making for the Ohio country. The United States Western Outpost, Fort Pitt, is at the head of the Ohio River. While the United States will attempt to expand into the Northwestern Territories north of the Ohio River, this avenue is held in check by British Fort Detroit, which is in turn building relationships with Northwest natives. We will zoom in to the Northeast. Despite new fault lines in the West, the military phase of the American Revolution has ended. On November 2, 1783, at Rocky Hill, New Jersey, General Washington issues his farewell orders to the Continental Army. The Army is disbanded. In November, Congress remains on the move, relocating from Princeton, New Jersey to Annapolis, Maryland. On November 25th, the last British troops leave New York City, a city the British had held for seven years. New York City is now free of British occupation. All United States cities are now free of British troops. Some 30,000 loyalists and runaway slaves leave New York City with the British Redcoats, relocating to Nova Scotia, Canada. Many thousands of loyalists will be rewarded with land in Canada. So after the Revolution, the population of British Canada increases with the arrival of loyalist transplants from the United States. In total, as many as 100,000 American loyalists, including up to 20,000 escaped slaves, relocated to Nova Scotia, the Caribbean islands, the British mainland, and even British India. While the last British ships are leaving New York City, George Washington rides into town. In December 1783, Thomas Mifflin is now President of Congress Assembled. On December 23, 1783, Congress is in session in Annapolis, Maryland. George Washington visits Congress and he resigns his command of the Army. Washington voluntarily steps away from the apex of power to return to his farm in Virginia. Across the Atlantic, King George was struck by Washington's resignation from power. The king said Washington was the greatest man in the world. Washington sets a precedent that a strong American leader chooses to withdraw from power. As the dust settles at the end of 1783, there is now a new nation of 13 states with room to grow to the Mississippi River. The British Empire yet remains on the continent as the colonies in Canada remain within His Majesty's dominion. In the south, Florida has returned to Spain, reattached to Spain's large territory of Louisiana west of the Mississippi. The Native American boundary has been pushed westward beyond the Appalachian Mountains, now running through the Ohio and Kentucky frontiers. 1783 comes to an end. Peace brings new challenges. It's apparent this early on that the new nation's financial issues aren't restricted to national debt. 
Everyday business is affected. The Confederation grants powers to the states, which means states collect revenue by imposing taxes on imports from other states. In the Northeast, for example, a merchant transporting grain from Pennsylvania to Maryland would have to pay a tax. If we look at New England, where there are robust markets with states closely set together, interstate taxes inhibit interstate trade. Let's zoom out. The Articles of Confederation present diplomatic issues. In 1784, Congress has sent John Adams to Britain as a foreign minister. The British, though, aren't sure if John Adams represents one country or 13 different countries, an issue that seemed to cause confusion on both sides of the Atlantic. We will zoom back into the United States. January 14, 1784. In Annapolis, Maryland, Congress ratifies the Treaty of Paris. April 23, 1784. Thomas Jefferson's Northwest Ordinance, detailing how the Northwest districts could achieve statehood, is passed by Congress. Jefferson's eye is on the West. In June 1784, Richard Henry Lee, the congressman who first proposed independence from Britain in 1776, is now president of Congress. A cashless Congress has no money to maintain the Continental Army. The Army is essentially disbanded, save for garrisons at Fort Pitt in Pennsylvania and West Point in New York. Many founding fathers had opposed a large standing army in peacetime, and now financial realities impose this situation. Also in June, Spain closes the Mississippi River to American trade. Spanish New Orleans is not available for American exports. So westward-looking Americans, who are hoping to utilize the Ohio-Mississippi system to export supplies to the Atlantic, were now without sea access. Meanwhile, at Fort Detroit, the British are supplying Great Lakes Native Americans. In August 1784, Congress relocates again, this time transferring from Annapolis, Maryland to New York City. November 1784, in Philadelphia, Robert Morris, financier of the Revolution, unable to obtain the revenues from Congress needed to repay the national debt, resigns from his office. 1784 comes to an end. Congress passes a second ordinance on the Northwest Territories in 1785. This ordinance devises a square grid system over the Northwest, with each square designating a township. Each township would also have a lot for a school. Much of the Midwest today is organized into counties and townships in a square grid pattern. With the organization of the Northwest Territories, Congress will make money selling these lands to settlers. Congress has finally made progress on a revenue generating operation. We will zoom out to a transatlantic view. By 1785, American merchants see declining exports, largely because they can no longer sell directly to the same markets in the British West Indies. Independence means American merchants must find new customers in Europe. July 25, 1785. Off Portugal, the United States merchant ship, the Maria, is captured by Barbary pirates. Five days later, on July 30th, the merchant, Dauphin, is also captured by pirates. The United States, with no money and no substantial navy, is at present helpless to save the captured American crewmen. Meanwhile, Thomas Jefferson is in Paris in 1785 as the new American ambassador to France. Jefferson gains access to large French book markets. He purchases numerous French books on political philosophy, economics, history, and the sciences, including works by Pascal and Voltaire. Jefferson sends many books back to Virginia for his friend James Madison. In Virginia, James Madison is going through the history of republics since antiquity, cobbling together a sound system for a republic. Regular businessmen are also pondering the efficiency of government. Merchants are still struggling with interstate trade. Selling products across state lines requires duties, as if each state is a different country. Merchants are increasingly wanting streamlined business across state lines. Streamlined interstate trade will require a stronger national government. 
In addition to interstate taxes, Spain's closure of New Orleans has become an issue that Congress must deal with. In November 1785, John Hancock is President of Congress. 1785 comes to an end. In June 1786, Nathaniel Gorham is President of Congress. August 1786, in New York City, John Jay presents Spain's terms to Congress. Spain will allow Americans to use their ports, but Spain will maintain control of the Mississippi River for at least 25 years. Northern merchants want access to Spanish markets, but Southerners are outraged that the Mississippi River would be forfeited. In 1786, Congress ruptures between North and South. No agreement will be reached with Spain, and navigation of the Mississippi River remains in Spain's control. Also in August, Massachusetts takes the spotlight. We will zoom into Massachusetts. Ten years after the Declaration of Independence, Western Massachusetts farmers, debt burdened and overtaxed, are losing land to creditors. Massachusetts has been jailing large numbers of debtors. Many of the penniless inmates are Revolutionary War veterans. Debt-loaded farmers disrupt court proceedings. In September 1786, the Massachusetts rebels, led by Revolutionary War veteran Daniel Shays, shuts down the Springfield Supreme Court. Shays' rebels are armed, and many have combat experience from the Revolutionary War. Massachusetts is in turmoil. We will zoom back out. Also in September, at Annapolis, Maryland, 12 delegates from five states meet to discuss improvements to the Articles of Confederation. James Madison of Virginia is there, and he has been doing extensive reading of history, including the books sent to him by Thomas Jefferson from France. Despite the governmental turmoil, America's settlers are populating the West. The territory of Vermont is quickly filling with new residents. Western Pennsylvania, at the headwaters of the Ohio River, is populating. Western Georgia is receiving settlers, and in the far western frontier, modern Kentucky and Tennessee, pioneers are producing more settlements. We will zoom out to a global view. Politics is politics and business is business. Despite the political disputes, Americans have returned to purchasing British goods in large sum. Americans, now free to trade with countries beyond Britain, are exporting goods to multiple European nations, including France and Portugal. United States merchant vessels are even trading with China at this time. We will zoom back into North America. 1786 comes to an end. In January 1787, Massachusetts remains a tinderbox. We will zoom into Massachusetts. Daniel Shea's rebels have not gone home. Shays has some 1,200 men. His plan is to secure the Springfield Armory. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts responds. The Massachusetts militia, over 4,000 strong, under Revolutionary War General Benjamin Lincoln, is dispatched from eastern Massachusetts for Springfield. Many wonder if this is a new Lexington and Concord in the making. Lincoln's state militia arrives in Springfield. Shays attempts to capture the Springfield Arsenal. Lincoln's militia repulse the attack. Shays withdraws. Lincoln pursues the rebels through Hadley, Massachusetts, towards Petersham. On February 4, 1787, Shays is defeated at Petersham. The young nation is coming full circle. The state militia is now the agency putting down rebellions. Shays' rebellion, along with the ongoing debt crisis, are convincing many that the Articles of Confederation is not powerful enough to govern. We will zoom back out. In February 1787, Arthur St. Clair is now President of Congress. In New York City, Congress is calling for a new convention in Philadelphia. States are requested to send representatives to Philadelphia to discuss the Articles of Confederation. In the spring of 1787, Philadelphia again becomes the center of political activity. Delegates from the states are returning to the city for a new convention, just as they had during the Continental Congress era. In April 1787, in Virginia, James Madison's long study of republics results in his essay, Vices of the Political System of the United States, in which Madison details the issues with the Articles of Confederation. 
As Madison makes his way to Philadelphia for the Constitutional Convention, he has a blueprint for a more perfect Constitution. On May 25, 1787, in Philadelphia, the Constitutional Convention is now in session, with many of the same delegates who had met in the same building during the days of the Continental Congress.